first world order radio finally finally we are on the air no doubt all right all right there's always gonna be somebody in the building on first world order radio begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. And others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories. Shit that works. Peace, peace. We're back once again. All right. We're going to speak about today is natural law and indigenous affairs and how it's all linked to the family of nations. So we're going to start off going to um, some information on natural law. Natural law is the highest law. All right, it correlates to what we refer to as universal law, cosmic law, um, in which in ancient Tamaria or Kemet or Egyptian times, ancient times, um, it would be correlated to Tahuti or Jehuti. Um, he had seven principles. Those seven principles, one was the law of mentalism, correspondence, cause and effect, which is karma, rhythm, vibration, gender, which is sex, um, as well as also um, polarity. Those are the seven laws. Now, his consort, um, his wife, was Mayat. She also had um, seven virtues or cardinal laws in which that dealt with um, the same laws in which that we deal supposedly as morals to this day, supposed to be love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. And there was two additional ones in which that um, will correlate to, um, you know, um, balance and order, you know. So Mayat had her seven laws, the seven principles, too, in which that when these laws are brought together, they come up to 14, in which that correlates to the 14 uh, fragmented pieces of Osir, or Osiris. And we're supposed to be bringing these pieces back together again in order to make a whole to be holistic, not just in the physical, but also in the spiritual. Because we are divine beings. That is our natural right, to be divine beings. All right, that is your birthright. All right, that is your vast estate. Your vast estate just is a land. Your vast estate is the spirit in which that is over the land, over the waters. All right, as it speaks of within the book of Genesis. So, um, I'm not here to get religious, 
um, but um, on natural law, um, natural law, you know, deals with um, what agrees with nature and the state of man, you know, that even with observation, it's maxims, which deals with peace and happiness of a society can never be, can, can always be preserved in that way, you know, because the maxims um, are something in which that we can always um, see through the light of reasoning. In other words, common sense. You know, in other words, this correlates to the Ten Commandments, in which that we know um, come from the um, 147 negative confessions, as it is called, misnomer. But they actually call is the um, um, admonitions um, of Mayat, or what is called um, the 42 principles of Mayat. Um, it come, it's, you'll see 147, you'll see 77, you'll see 42. Um, but based on the text in which that you read coming from the Book of the Dead, or what's called the um, Perim Heru, um, Sut, which is the book of coming forth by day and night, um, knowledge of natural laws may be obtained merely by um, the light of reason. And for that fact, they're essentially um, agreeable, you know, with the constitution of human nature. You know, natural law exists regardless of whether it is enacted as positive law. You know, um, the wind exists, electricity exists, you know, um, gravity exists. All these things exist without you having to recognize it or not. This is natural law. And although there may be instances where natural law, um, you know, um, was seen or appear um, not to be enacted, that is on our parts for um, our ignorance. You know, we're ignoring the facts, you know, and in order to tap into natural law, you must be a natural person, a human being, you know, um, you know, as opposed to an artificial or fictitious person, you know, such as a corporation. A corporation is a fictitious or artificial entity. The phrase natural person does not include a corporate entity, you know, but the phrase person, you know, can you know, be included as an artificial person. So you never want to put in any of your affidavits the word just person by itself. You want to make sure you make the distinction between a natural person and an artificial person. You know? Um, you know, so we have to make these distinctions because it's only the natural person or the sovereign person of the land who can make the laws. You actually can't make laws for natural persons if you de facto. And these laws do not have to be um these laws do not have to be um listened to as far as natural persons are concerned because they have no effect on us whatsoever because oftentimes those defect of laws are culpable laws all right now when you get into culpable um they tie it back to uh, to individuals who use the word colored, you know, in other words, i.e., us, you know, but we're going to get more into that in a second. According to Black's Law Dictionary, the seventh edition, a natural person is indigenous, a native, the original or natural inhabitant of a country. Once again, Black's Law Dictionary, seventh edition, a natural person is indigenous, native, the original or natural inhabitant of a country. Now, when you go to Webster Student Dictionary International Encyclopedia Edition, um, when you look up the word native, it says it's born or produced in a region or country in which one lives, indigenous, or pertaining to one's birth or to a place or circumstance, natural rather than acquired and born, or pertaining to original inhabitants usually apply to non-European peoples, once again, of or pertaining to original inhabitants, usually apply to non-European peoples. So the European, even by his own definition, um, state that they are not indigenous. Now, when we look up in Webster Universal Dictionary 1936 edition, and it defines the word American. 
It says an aboriginal or one of the various copper-colored natives found on the American continent by the Europeans, the original application of the name. They don't tell you in that definition the original application of the name, though. However, in the next year edition, they do. If you get Webster Universal Dictionary 1937, it defines American again, an aboriginal or one of the various copper-colored natives found on the American continent by the descendant by the descents of European settlers. The following is the original application of the name Maru. Maru, M-E-R-U. That is the very end of the word more. Now, if you go and get um, Herutich uh, Restored, um, Volume 2, written by Julio L. Rose, he states this, that many historians allege that the honor and credit went to Americo Vespusky as explorer. Cologne, which is Columbus, did not discover anything, nor did Americo Vespusky, nor did the Europeans name it, in other words, America. The word America was developed from the Metuneter name Maru, M-E-R-U, which means leader, chief, ruler, etc. The word America is how the Greeks called Maru, who pronounced it Amaru Kos. From the South American Indians, Tupac Amaru. The word America bears no relevance whatsoever to Americo Vanspusky. The word is also borrowed by the Arabic language and is called Amer, meaning ruler, chief, governor, prince, etc. The Europeans' latest corruption of the word Maru reads Maro. Now, Maro is another name for the Ethiopians or the Abyssinians. If Cologne, Columbus, discovered America, why then does Vespusky enjoy the credit of having it named after him? Um, then it goes into Meru or Mary or Meros, which means chief, director, overseer. So this is what is inside of um, Heritage Restored, Volume 2. Now, we go further in um, Gods and Spacemen in the Ancient West. Don't get freaked out with the title. It got some good information in it by um, W. Raymond Drake. When he gets to the chapter on ancient America, that's what we need to focus on. All right? Don't focus on the spaceman. That's the problem now. Always looking outside of yourself. America is popularly supposed to have received its name from the mariner Americo Vespusky. Actually, Alberto Vespucio, that was his name. All right? It states his name was um, Alberto Vespucio. His name was not Americo Vespucci. He took that name, or they nicknamed him that, because he came to America. And so they began to call him Americos or Americas. But that was not originally his name. His name was Alberto. It says right here, um, in Central America, the word Americ signifies great mountains, evoke Maru, the sacred mountain in Hindu tradition, said to be the center of seven continents. Ancient America was linked with India through Los Lemuria. The early voyagers probably believed America to be the native word for the land itself, so they too would use it. Vespucio Conrad, instead of Albertico, would nickname him Americo. You see that? Some natives called their, called their land Atlanta, Echoes of Atlantis. So we have to understand um, these indigenous terms. America, the name itself existed prior to Americo Vespucci, as we just seen. That was a nickname in which that his comrades gave him because of his so-called discovery but it was already named there prior to him here, coming here. And this is um, shown to you in the definition which that we read in Webster Universal Dictionary, 1937 edition, where it defines American as aboriginal, one of the various copper-colored natives from, uh, found on the American continent. You see that on the American continent by the descents of European settlers. The following is the original application of the name Maru. 
So that ended the debates on the discussion of um, us being Americans. We all. All right? We all. And it means rulers, chiefs, governors, prince. All right? The symbol that is used in ancient Kemet or Temeria was an owl. It was an owl. The reason why? Because the owl can turn his head the whole 360 degrees. And an owl was symbolic to wisdom because it was able to see in all directions. So it was basically symbolic to the all seeing eye, which is symbolic to the pineal gland, in which that when it is fully activated, you can see past, present, and future events as clearly as you're seeing out your two physical eyes. So on the on the front of the dollar bill in the right um hand corner um above the right one you will see a picture of an owl. When they go to the Bohemian Grove in California, they worship a fifty foot tall owl. In which that they tell you that is a symbol of Moloch. But Moloch is the same word as Malik, which means king. They tell you that they did a um, fire ritual to this deity in which that symbolically they do human sacrifices and all of these things. Of course, this is supposedly mentioned in the Old Testament. But what they don't tell is that that was another name for Melchizedek in the Old Testament. See, these are all these clues in which that is given, but nobody's explaining them. So people is getting off in La La Land, you know, thinking that, um, you know, everything in which that they seen is evil, or well, that's part of Satanism, especially when it comes to the ancient comedic symbols. So let's continue on. So when we look at natives. or indigenous, or natural, they all make a distinction from artificial, because according to Blackstone Dictionary 6th edition, artificial persons means persons created or devised by human law for the purpose of society and government, as distinguished from natural persons. Corporations are examples of artificial persons. Your name spoke in all caps is an artificial person. This is how they allegedly made you a citizen. But the 14th Amendment was never fully ratified. So um, that means you're not a citizen. All right, we spoke about this um, last week. And was that when you get into the real science you was, um, do so, and do some research, you would see that um, the 14th Amendment was never fully ratified. All right, so, um, and plus, we was not for citizens to begin with based on the Dress Scott case decision in which that um, Judge Taney, even though it was a, um, a so-called opinion, he stated that there's nothing in which that a Negro has in which that a white man is bound to respect. And he also said that we will never be citizens of the United States. We are not citizens and will never be. And that's fine because that means that this gives you the opportunity in order to define yourself, being that you are the original Americans. All right? You know, they're always trying to hyphenate you. Matter of fact, we're the only people that change our names, like we said, um, every 30 years. A hundred years ago, you know, at the turn of the century, 1900s, we was called Negroes. By 1930, um, we was called Coloreds. By 1960, we was called blacks. By 1990, we was called African Americans. And then, of course, you know, you got Afro American up in there too, somewhere by the 1970s or so. But we the only ones that changed our names basically every 30 years. Chinese 100 years ago was called Chinese. Africans 100 years ago was called Africans. Japanese 100 years ago was called Japanese. Europeans, 100 years ago, was called Europeans. Mexicans, 100 years ago, was called Mexicans. You know, 
So um, why, why, why is it um, we're the only ones in which that changed its name? You know, because we're looking for a land connection. And if you don't know that you are the original inhabitants of this land also, not just of Africa, but throughout the diaspora, um, as Dr. Khaled used to say, Africa is our throne, but the earth is our home. And this is something on which that has been forgotten um, by um, individuals, you know, who was part of the revol uh, revolutionary um, movement, you know, up under um, Dr. Khaled, you know. You know, there's people who are saying that Dr. Khaled was mistaken when he said that he was a Moor. No, Dr. Khaled um, was teaching when he was Rashidi, when he was given, when he was going by another name prior to becoming Dr. Khaled. Um, he was already teaching on the Moorish legacy. An individual who states that they don't know his history. All they know is um, his days in the nation of Islam or his Black Panther days. They don't know that he was already teaching on Moorish legacy and Moorish information prior to him even having the name Dr. Khaled Muhammad. All right. So, um, when we look up indigenous, um, we went over the um, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People last week, some of the laws. We also went over the definition by the United Nations, which is the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. They specifically say that in this declaration, indigenous people are those who embody historical continuity or continuity, excuse me, with societies which existed prior to the conquest and settlement of their territories by Europeans, as well as people brought involuntarily to the New World who freed themselves and culture from which they have been torn. So that means that even the people who came from Africa, and we're not saying that we are not Africans, we're just saying that we are Africans much older than just 400 years ago. The Omex was here, like we said, 5,000 years ago. The Folsoms were here over 75,000 years ago. The Washita was here over 100,000 years ago. The Twa people was here over 2 million years ago. These various ancient tribes was already here millions of years ago, thousands of years ago. So you're thinking that the first impact of Africans reaching this shore was just 400 years ago, and you're sadly mistaken. Because even in the United Nations Declaration or Definition of Indigenous, they specifically state that as well as people brought involuntarily to the new world who freed themselves and culture from which that they have been torn. And it says self-identification as Indigenous or tribal should be regarded as a fundamental criteria for the determining groups to which this provision of this declaration applies. You must produce self-identification. It must be you who do so. You have the right to belong to an indigenous community or nation. This is an endeavor in the rights of indigenous people. Also, when you read um, another definition, okay, uh, which I think that was probably the um, best one as far as um, explaining um, that this that we were here prior to the Europeans. You know, we went over the fact of the Rex 84 and the so-called um, King Alfred plan, where it specifically says that we are bound to this continent by heritage. And then we read you the definition of heritage, and which means birthright. So. You have individuals, settlers, stillers, robbers, who is occupying your land and giving you defecto laws that you're supposed to um, just say, okay, boss, I agree with you. And you're not supposed to question this. I mean, damn, at least question it. Please. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. How do we know that there was an empire here prior to the Albions? Because it's within their own Black Law Dictionary, what is called the Mexamore Empire or its imperial government, you know, which stretched out, um, you know, into Kenya, Zimbabwe, Indonesia, Korea, 
you know, in other parts of the world, you know. It was what is called the Western Empire. It was um, part of the Ultima Empire. The Empress Vidyasi, um, Tierra, Turnica, Gaston L. Bay, or Washita, she states that it was called the Washita Deductamania, or Empire Washita Deductamania, which is what is talking about the ancient empire of the mound builders. So it goes into amorality. Let's go to amorality. Black Snow Dictionary, 4th edition. It says amorality. It says, it is properly the successor of the consular courts, which was emphatically the courts of the merchants and seagoing persons. In other words, another word for more, and it's, um, um, synonym is navigator, the master of the seven seas. And it says, establishing the principal maritime cities on the revival of commerce after the fall of the Western Empire. Excuse me? So, the Amorality Court became the successor to the Consular Courts after the fall of the Western Empire. I thought we was in the West. I thought it was supposed to be the Western Empire in which that is now thriving. What Western Empire are they referring to <laughs> prior to them establishing this amorality court system that they now have? And we said they inherited from our consular courts. Well, you go to consular courts, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, it says courts held by the consuls of one country within the territory of another under the authority given by treaty for the settlement of civil cases. In some instances, they have also a criminal jurisdiction, but in this respect, was subject to the review by the courts of the home government. The last of the United States consular courts, Morocco, was abolished in 1956. 1956. They're telling you that just in 1956 was the end for the fall of the last vestige of the Western Empire, of the Moors, of the Ottoman Empire. Hence, Empire Washington deduct the money. This is what they're saying. So, we have to keep all these things in mind. Now, the family of nations, where that fits in at? Well, Martin Luther King who was actually called Michael King, um, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, he says, we are approaching the area where the voice of the Constitution is not clear. We have left the realm of constitutional rights, and we are now entering the area of human rights. Malcolm X speaks on civil rights versus human rights. All right? Um, he says, human rights come before civil rights. You can never get civil rights until you have human rights. Human rights represents the rights to be human. Whatever you respect and recognize as a human, your civil rights are automatic. No. You have to get the recognition of human rights first. This is why people can come from Africa and Asia and immediately are able to benefit from what the Constitution stands for because they are recognized as human beings. When they touch the shores of North America, but the black people in this country, all of the human characteristics were destroyed by slavery. Our language was destroyed, our history was destroyed, and our culture was destroyed. And then the white man taught us that we were savages in the jungle, living in a subhuman level. And for this reason, when they put the Constitution together, they classified our people as three-fifths of a man, which meant subhuman, not a complete human being. And once our human characteristics was completely destroyed, this gave them justification for treating us like we were animals. Then also justified them selling us from plantation like you sell a horse or a cow or a bag of wheat. Why George Jefferson himself historically is on record having sold, having traded a black man for a keg of molasses, which shows that he did not regard black men as human beings. If the black man human rights were respected, we would have never been um, a slave here in America. 
and if his human race has been restored by the Emancipation Proclamation, automatically we would have been citizens after the Civil War. So we must be regarded as human. Our human race must be respected before we can ever be regarded as citizens and our civil rights be respected. So that was from his speech, uh, Malcolm's speech on um, civil rights versus human rights. Now go to the bullet or the ballot. He goes even deeper. And he says, in time, you know you're within the law, within your legal rights, within your moral rights, in regard with justice. Then die for what you believe in. Do not die alone. Let your dying be reciprocal. This is what is meant by equality. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. When you begin to get into this area, we need new friends. We need new alliance. We need to expand the civil rights struggle to a higher level, to the level of human rights. Where you are in civil rights, uh, whenever you are in civil rights um, struggle, whether you know it or not, you are confining yourself to the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam. No one from outside world can speak on you um, out in your behalf as long as your struggle is a civil rights struggle. Civil rights comes with the domestic area of this country. All of our African brothers and our Asian brothers and our Latin American brothers cannot open their mouths and interfere in the domestic affairs of the United States. As long as it is civil rights, um, this comes under the jurisdiction of Uncle Sam. But the United Nations has what's, um, what's known as the Charter of Human Rights. It has a committee to deal in human rights. You may be wondering why all the atrocities that has been committed in Africa and in Hungary um, and in Asia and Latin America are brought before the United Nations, and the Negro problem is never brought before the United Nations, this is part of the conspiracy, that that um, this old, tricky, blue-eyed liberal who is supposed to be your friend and um, be yours and my friend, supposed to be in our corner, supposed to be subs subsidizing um, our struggle and supposed to be acting in the capacity as an advisor, never tell you anything about human rights. They keep you wrapped up in civil rights, and you spend so much time barking up the civil rights tree, you don't even know that a human rights tree is on the same floor. When you expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights, you can then take the um, the case of the black man into um, before the world court. But the only level you can do it at is at the level of human rights. Civil rights keep you under his restrictions, under his jurisdiction. Civil rights keep you in his pocket. Civil rights means you are acting, Uncle. Um, you are asking Uncle Sam to treat you right. Human rights are something you are born with. Human rights are your God-given rights. Human rights are the rights that are recognized by all nations of the world. And any time anyone violates your human rights, you can take them to the world court. All right, Uncle Sam's hands are drenched, dripping in blood, dripping with the blood of the black man in this country. He's the earth's number one hypocrite. He has the audacity. Yes, he has. Imagine him posing as the leader of the free world, the free world, and you over here um, singing, we shall overcome. Expand the civil rights struggle to the level of human rights. Take it into the United Nations where our African brothers can throw their weight on our side, where our Asian brothers can throw their weight on our side, where our Latin American brothers can throw their weight on our side, and where 800 million Chinamen are sitting there waiting to throw their weight on our side. Let the world know how bloody his hands are. Let the world know the trust, um, the hypocrisy they practice over here. All right? So Malcolm goes on to say that nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. If you're a man, you take it. Now, this is what this is coming to. You have to define yourself. We told you that the criteria um, for um, being seen as being indigenous and being able to ex um, establish your human rights is through your self-identification. Now, this is federal law, and this is state law. When you go up under the rules of evidence in any state or at the federal level, they give you authentication and self-identification. In order for a document to be authentic authenticated, um, it must have certain things, certain criteria it must meet, witnesses, signatures, or autographs, as we would say, um, ancient documents, testimonies, so forth and so on. And then it should be self um once you have done, once it's been authenticated, in other words, it's genuine, real, in other words, you have taken it and put it on the public record, it is genuine, it is real. 
And it, being that it's in the affidavit for me, that it must be rebutted word for word, point for point, if it's in the affidavit. If the court does not rebut your affidavit, then your affidavit stands the truth in any commerce or any court in the um, country. And you just simply say, I stand upon the information in which that is in the affidavit, Your Honor. Some say my honor. Whatever the case is, it needs to start being done. This is the way in which that you invoke constitutional law, treaty law. Um, laws, um, 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 the, um, the supreme law of the land, as they say. All right? This is what takes you outside of the jurisdiction, as we just finished talking about. In order for a case to proceed, there's two things in which that must be within a court situation. The court must have jurisdiction over the person and over the subject matter. You just took it out of their hands with the subject matter as you far as you declare yourself indigenous. That's out of their hands. That's now is international law. That's not national law. That's not state law. This is the way that it's supposed to be done. Because you're not a citizen of the United States. My wife and I called down to the um called down to the passport place probably like about maybe the United States of American passport probably about maybe four years ago. And my wife said, Well, you know that we're not US citizens and the lady said, Yes, so we know that you're not US citizens. However, do you need this passport? So they're not even lying any longer. They're just letting it all out. This information is just coming out. So we have to um, get it while it's coming. Otherwise, we'll get left behind. All right. Now, Whenever, let's go into some more information here. Let's go into the laws of nations, because the laws of nations um, are actually the laws in which that ties you back. All right? Um, but before we get there, let's talk about um, my brother, um, Paul Robeson, who worked tirelessly for the civil rights movement and he tried to take it to the human rights level. All right? And this is actually what caused him to be um somewhat barred and here in the United States despised. All right, and he wrote a document called um We Charge Genocide in which that he um um brought to the United Nations in nineteen fifty one. The document asserted that the United States federal government, by its failure to act against the lynching in the United States, was guilty of genocide under Article 2 of the United States Genocide Convention. Hundreds of executions were documented in the petition in the section evidence, although the, um, the petition states that there were at least 10,000 um, that was executed. The real number would never be known because the incidences were never properly documented or recorded. The petition also described conspiracy against um, said blacks or African Americans by inhibiting their ability to vote through poll taxes and literacy tests. All right? So Paul Robeson, even back in 1951, was already fighting from the civil rights to a human rights um, level and taking it um, before the United Nations. All right? So when we get into the end of time and the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, it is said that, um, come, come all ye Asiatics and hear the truth of your nationality and birthright because you are not Negroes. Learn of your forefathers, um, ancient and divine creed that you may learn to love instead of hate. Come and link yourselves back with the family of nations. This is what's said by, um, Prophet Noble Jirali. Um, What is this 
come and link ourselves back to the family of nations. How can you link yourselves back to the family of nations if you do not know the laws of nations? That's number one. What are the laws of nations? Well, the laws of nations are private international law between sovereign individuals, family, tribes, courts, grand juries, townships, counties, states, and nations. This has been well established under various international conventions for thousands of years. All the administrative rules and regulations, statutes, and uniform commercial code and constitutions of the various countries are based ultimately upon the organic law of nations. The law of nations is the law of sovereigns. See, they have made that word. All right. They have made the word sovereign taboo. That's what they have done. They made the word sovereign taboo. But yet, at the 33rd degree, they use it. Sovereign Inspector General. Or even sovereign grand commander. But yet, you can't use it. Or it's taboo. You shouldn't use it because now you'd be tied to the sovereign white groups. The whites are not indigenously from here, as we already have shown you through their own definitions, through their own authorship. They're not sovereign. They can be title sovereign from those original inhabitants who are sovereign. In other words, we can give them permission to work here through treaty, through trade, through commerce. But they are not here, not from here indigenously. They are not um, the original people here. So stop that nonsense. You're not studying their information. They were studying more of science. The law of nations is the law of sovereigns derived from the principles of natural law. It is from the laws of nation that constitutes that constitutions are created and lawful the your governments consummated. Any government that um, portends to hold power or wield authority without being answered, answerable um, to these laws or de facto. And unlawful governments ruled by occupation, absorption, and exploitation. De facto governments justify their existence by the rule of force and coercion instead of the rule of law. So we're not in a lawful de jure society. So stop trying to justify the negative things in which that is taking place to the Moors and those who don't claim to be Moors at this time in their court system because these are de facto courts. And if you was not standing up there saying that you understand the law in which that um, they was asking you about because the judge asked you specifically, do you understand the charges being brought up against you? And if you standing there saying, yes, you do, then yes, you just became liable to the bond in which that they attached to that statue which is your body is going to pay for because you're the collateral. So they're going to put you in jail for a certain amount of time because that is going to equal the amount to that bond. We'll get into that in a, in a few or so. So legitimate, lawful de jure governments of the sovereign people, by the sovereign people, and for the sovereign people do exist in the rule of law. It is the universal rule of the laws of nations that the created can never be greater than the creator. In other words, the government can never be greater than a sovereign. The federal United States government based its entire existence upon the political will of the sovereign people. Go and read each constitution within the 50 states. Such a principle has been universally accepted and followed in at least the following cases to date of um, Odougal, um case, um, 1933, um, Benner versus Porter, Clinton versus um, Inkleberts, Honenbuckle versus um, Toombs, um, Good versus Martin, Reynolds versus United States. It goes on and on and on. According to the Bouvier's Law Dictionary, 1856, the law of nation is the science which teaches the right 
subsizing, or subsizing excuse me, between nations and states and the obligation correspondence to those rights. The phrase international law has been purported in its stead. So international law is the law of nations. It is the system of rule deductible by natural reason from the immutable principles of natural justice and established by universal consent amongst the civilized inhabitants of the world in order to decide all disputes and to ensure the um, observation of good faith of good faith and justice in the intercourse which may frequently occur between them and the individuals belonging to each or is dependent upon mutual compact treaties, leagues, agreements between the separate, free, and independent communities. International law is generally divided into two branches. The natural law of nations, consisting of the rule of justice, application to the conduct of states. The positive law of nations is two, which consisted of the voluntary law of nations, derived from the presumptive, a presumed um, consent of nations arising out of their general usage. So, natural law, positive law, is the international law or the law of nations that you, as the family of nations, must link, must link and connect yourself back to. We showed you that natural person is indigenous. So by you declaring that you are indigenous, then you have attached yourself back into the family of nations. And not necessarily the United Nations, because that United Nations actually is de facto of the de jure law of nations, which is based on real international law. But international law, once again, is based on common sense, in which that is derived from all of us. In other words, it's right reasoning. So what is a state? What is a nation? A nation or state or bodies of, um, of body politics. Societies of men united together for the purpose of promoting their mutual safely and advantage by the joint efforts of their combined strength. That's a nation or a state. So whenever someone say that they don't recognize the um, Washington as a nation, by the sheer definition, that's an oxymoron. Or better yet, they're just morons. Because nations or states are body politics. Societies of men, women, united together for the purpose of promoting their mutual safety and advantage by the joint efforts of their combined strength. So whenever anyone say that they are Washita or that they are indigenous, they are a nation or a state. Definition of the law of nations. The law of nations is the science which teaches the right substance society, excuse me, between nations and states and the obligation correspondence to those rights. And what light like nations and states ought to be considered. Nations being composed of men naturally free and independent. See, you're not naturally free and independent. You're still thinking like a slave. Three-fifths of a um, um, person. The Constitution states that you're three-fifths person. So, therefore, you're still thinking as a subhuman, as Malcolm said. You're not thinking as a whole being. You're not thinking holistically. You're not thinking as a five-fifths or a whole or one whole being. There's two senses, masonically, in which that was taken from you. You have five senses. See, touch, taste, smell, hear. Two senses was taken from you, your sight and your hearing. Meaning, I can you're hearing this lecture right now. You can hear me speak to you, but you might not necessarily accept it. I can show you the information within the various texts or various books, magazines, articles, and you still might not believe it. So there's two things in which that was taken from you, in which that classifies you as three-fifths of a human being. Or better yet, as monkey see, monkey do. Or when they always show you the three monkeys, one monkey has his hands over his mouth, over his ears, and over his eyes. 
This is why they always show you the monkey with the fez on his head. Clapping them damn symbols. This is what all this is all symbolic to. You see that? So, there are things in which that was taken from you. Symbolically, your birthright and your divine creed, and you must return those yourself. They stole it, but you must return it. Nations, oh, let's go down. Nations being composed of men naturally free and independent, and who before the establishment of civil society lived together in a state of nature. So we must learn how to live together again in a state of nature. Right now, what I'm seeing in the Moorish community or in, in the indigenous community is not in a state of nature. We have taken on the European mindset. We have been indoctrinated with his ways, his behavior, his actions. We no longer how to, we don't know how to communi- communicate with each other or commune with each other any longer. Everything has to be alternative motives. Everybody got an agenda. But yet claiming to be for the upliftment of fallen humanity. Claiming to be. It is a subtle point when writers on the natural law that all men inherit from nature a perfect liberty and independence of which they cannot be deprived without their own consent. So if we was on if we was in court with natural law, which is common sense law, common law, right reasoning. If we was in court and we had this type of attitude, then we wouldn't be in court saying that we understand the charges being brought up against us. Because you would know that um, those charges are made up. Because it's coming from a defecto government in which that um, uses your physical body as a commodity or collateral. So it goes on. In a state, the individual citizen does not enjoy them freely and absolutely because they have made a partial surrender of them to the sovereign. But the body of the nation, the state, remains absolutely free and independent with respect to all men and all other nations as long as it is not voluntarily submitted to them. All right? So, we have to understand um, these various laws. It says of, of the state and of sovereignty, a nation or a state, as it has been said at the beginning of this work, is a body politic or society of men united together for the purpose of promoting their mutual safety and advantage by their combined strength from the very design that induces a number of men to form a society which has its common interests and what is to act in concert. And it is necessary that there shall be established a public authority to order and direct, which is to be done by each of the relations to the end of the associate. Um, this political authority is the sovereignty, and he or they um, who are invested with it are the sovereign. All right? So what they're saying is is that, like, for example, um, we elect the senators or um, the judges, the House of Representatives, or what is called Congress, you know, uh, the judicial seats and so forth. So they have a certain amount of sovereignty, which is um, what we would call immunity. All right? This is what they're saying. But being that the government is defecto, actually they don't. So... um, Let's go on. If you get the book, Montauk of the Dead, by Peter Moon, if you go to the chapter, it says the Ali Shuffle. He goes on and says that there were certain things in which that was reached. He says when the Moore Science reached its peak in 1929, 
It was on the heels of the greatest but most dangerous discovery that Drew Ali ever made. In 1928, Ali attended a Pan-American conference in Havana, Cuba, where he enjoyed broad recognition from a host of other countries. They were, of course, recognizing his sovereign status. Remember when over last week that he was a prince in Washington. Matter of fact, he was the fifth um, prince of the Maison um, de Rouge. All right? So he was part of the royal bloodline, which deals with the um, Tunica and the Washington, which is what we now call the Turner and the Washington family, which is the imperial family, which the emperor says about 85% of us is from that bloodline. And recently, 15% in which those who was brought here, um, you know, mixed in with us. Um, but, as, of course, as you've seen, within that definition of indigenous, they was included into that bloodline because 15% don't eradicate the 85. The 85 eradicates or, um, you know, toned down to 15%. So, you know, that's how it goes based on the numbers. Um, so that means um, the 85% genes would become more prevalent. And it says that they were, of course, recognizing his sovereign status as a Moorish national who was representing the ancient empire of a Maxim. Keep in mind that other countries had no reason to fear Drew Ali or what he represented. It was at this conference, however, that he received a document um, which was to change the face of the Moorish science forever and would eventually lead to what is known as the Great Schism. Um, that is the name of Moorish community used in reference to the dispersal of the Moorish science into different groups. Um, the document Drew Ali received was a copy of a mandate whereby the Mexican Empire extended a land grant to the entire um, Western Hemisphere to, a certain Europe, to certain Europeans. He says, I have not yet seen the document and its exact content are highly mysterious. Yet his ramification literally turned the United States of America upside down. Essentially, it leased America to a certain party for a particular number of years, not unlike the way China leased Hong Kong to Great Britain. The lease was up in 2004. This is what Peter Moon says within the Montauk Book of the Dead in his book. Now, Delaney Lenape um, called the Nanakotes or the Delaware Moors or the Abenaki Moors. Um, you know, they were also called the Pennsylvania Moors, who was the Washington Northeastern Tribe branch. Um, they signed the lease or this land grant with William Penn, whom the state of Pennsylvania is named after. This is the reason why Pennsylvania housed the first capital in this city called Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, which was designed by who? Mm -hmm. Big Ben Bay, Emmanuel Moali, Benjamin Banneker, a.k.a. Prince Hall, who was actually a prince of the Abenaki. The word Abenaki uh, means the father of the serpent, um, of the sky serpent. In other words, um, the master of the Kundalini energy. So, we was reading from those land documents last week. That land grant, that information is found within the Return of the Ancient One by the Empress, Verdiasi, Tierra, um, Tunica, Washington, Gaston L. Bay. Get her book. It has the Henry Turner versus the United States and the heirs of Henry Turner versus the United States. And you can also get the case of the United States versus King, in which that shows that the United States did not own the land called the Louisiana proper or what we what they missed on the call the Louisiana Purchase. That land was never purchased. And that is more than 13 states going all the way up into almost the entire whole of Canada. That is the land mandate that we have been able to find and that I have seen, that we have laid our, um, our actual eyes on. I can't tell you about something in which that I have not seen. I can tell you what, what I have seen and where it is located at. 
Also, if you get my book, The First World Order, I have all of those documents in there and plus more, in which that goes into the various um, land grants. So, see, this is not something in which that we are talking about. We have actually seen it. We experienced it, you know. So I can't keep telling you about this vast estate, you know, um, but yet never seen it. Never seen the documentation in order to verify it. All right. So this is what um, we'll be at right now. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now. Um, but anyone who has questions in the chat room, we'll get to you and uh, answer some questions. So put them in the chat room for right now. But... um. Um, we went over John Henry Clark also last week in his book, The African, Christopher Columbus, and the Myth of the New World. And he says, it must also be added that America Vance Busky on his voyage to the Americas witnessed the Mandingos of Mali. Now, who's the Mandingos of Mali? That is the Omecs and the Songhai Empires. The Songhai Empires. And he says that the Songhai Empires was later identified as the Moroccan Empire, out of which the Atlantic returned to Africa. This is what this is what John Henry Clark says. He says that the Songhai Empires and that the Mandingo of the Malians and the Songhai Empires was later identified as the Moroccan Empire. In the article African Explorers of the New World by um Arnold G. Um Harold excuse me, Harold G. Lawrence. He states, we can now positively, positively state that the Mandingos of Mali and the Songhai Empires and possibly other Africans crossed the Atlantic to carry on trade in the Western Hemisphere, Indians, and further succeeded in establishing colonies throughout the Americas. This is the second impact on America. So nobody bought us here. Initially, we were already here. He was already doing trade with our brothers and sisters across the waters. Davion didn't start that. He got us thinking that we didn't we didn't know anything about um, seafaring. That we was not navigators. All right. Let me see, I got a question here. Um, brother um Haru asked the question Haru asked the question, was the Revolutionary War the separation of more empire from the European land charter? All right. Um basically that's what was going on, Brother Haru. Um the um the Moors ruled the South. Right, there's more so the Civil War, not just the Revolutionary War, which took um, place, um, you know, years beforehand. But during the Civil War, it was more so that in which that it was able to be seen, in which that you had the separation of the Moors in the South, who actually was running the South at the time, and um, those Europeans in the North who wanted to use the slaves in order to come and work in their factories for textile in order to build up what is called the Industrial Revolution. In other words, they didn't use the South, you know, for the picking of cotton, for those various things. Now you got to take that material and you need workers in order to manufacture it. So... In that regard, when we look at not just the Revolutionary War, but we look at the Civil War, you can tell that that was more so um, the separation because um, if you read um, certain books, such as um, Ancient and Modern Britons by David Ricci, he speaks on how the term blackmail was a, um, was a term that was used only up until um, the late 1800s, in which that the Moors 
um, was paid tribute by all of the European countries. This is what he says. Get the book. Get the books, volume one and two. Okay, of um, David um, David um, MacRitchie, which that he teaches on that. Okay. Um, he said some other things, you know, and if I can find those particular statements, we can get into it. But the family of nations, all right, um, what we found out is that the laws of nations, which was reordained and reestablished by the amalgamated Moors about 13,000 years ago, which is now called the family of nations, the term family of nations up until 1914 was headed by the Osmali Bay Empire, a.k.a. the Ultima Empire, that extended to the American continent and was ruled by the aboriginals and the sovereign people called the Lenny Lanapi, who are the Washita. Um, matter of fact, in the um, Constitution, it says, we the people, they, was, um, they are the ones who established the United States of Monaco or Morocco. All right? In the family of nations, it consists of three league governments, all right, erroneously called Iroquois, Algonquin, and the Suez, and 17 independent Republican states with thousands of countries, towns, and even village cities. All right, the phrase "family of nations" is codified in the Blackstone Dictionary, Seventh Edition, and its definition is a word of art form constructed to confuse and uh, misguide the average unlearned reader. The phrase "family of nations" is also mentioned. And on the Blackstone Dictionary, fourth through sixth edition, with the definition of the United States. Um, basically, the family of nations, the sovereign power of the United States and the family of nations is vastly, um, or vast executively in the United States of the government. What that basically means is, is that um, we, the people, in which that, um, when you look up who established this Republican, this Republican form of government, um, for them, it came through two certain individuals, and which that you would see on the back of your um, two-dollar bill. On the back of the dollar bill, the individual who was sitting um, in the fifth seat is John Hansen, and then if you count to the thirteenth seat, you would see the individual by um, the name of Benjamin Bay or Ben Bay Emmanuel Moali, known as Benjamin Banneker, who is also referred to as Prince Hall. The Freemasons say that Prince Hall is on the back of the $2 bill. They don't never explain it. But that is actually Benjamin Banneker. You will see, compare Benjamin Banneker's life to Prince Hall's life, and you will see that they both lived and died around the exact same time period. Between 1806 to 7 to 19, to, um, to, um, excuse me, um, 1735, uh, to 1738 to 1806, 1807, they lived during that time period. So this is where you'll find the connections um, between them, all right? So um, that is um, actually, you know, what we're supposed to be um, understanding is how this government was established. And, of course, um, if you know John Hansen, he was the first president up under the Articles of Confederation. He was also um, Washington. And um, you would get um, a book by the name of Dirty Little Secrets, Part 2, um, by Dr. Claude Anderson. All right, Dr. Claude Anderson. Um, in the book, he breaks down um this um that John Hansen was the first president so called black president up on you know of the United States up under the Articles of Confederation. All right. Um we knew that we, this so called new country was formed, you know, March the first, seventeen eighty one with the adoption of the Articles of Confederation. Um this article was actually proposed June eleventh, seventeen eighty 
1776, but was not agreed upon by Congress until November 15, 1775. Maryland refused to sign the contract until Virginia and, and, um, and New York ceded their western lands. All right, Maryland was afraid that these states would gain too much power in the new government for such a large amount of land. All right, so uh, once the um, signing took place in 1781, a president was needed to run the country. John Hanson was chosen unanimously by Congress, which included George Washington at the time. Um, as you know, George Washington even wrote him, you know, and wrote him a letter, you know, giving him high honors for obtaining the um, highest seat in the land. So, in fact, all of our um, other um, potential candidates even refused to run against John Hanson. All right? John Hanson ordered the um, foreign troops off the um, American soil as well as well to remove all foreign flags. Um, this was um, quite a feat concerning the fact that so many European countries had stake in the United States since the days following Columbus. Hansen um, established a great seal on the United on the um, um, on the United States, um, with all of the presidents has um, since been acquired to use as their official document. All right, this um, um, John Hansen also established the first Treasury Department, the first Secretary of War, the first Federal Post Office, and the first Federal um, Affairs Department. Lastly, he declared that the fourth. Thursday on every November will be Thanksgiving, which is still true today. So um, the Articles of Confederation only allow the president to serve one-year term um, during any three-year period. So John Hansen um, actually accomplished quite a bit um, in such a little time. Right, He served in that order from November the 5th, 1781, until November the 3rd, 1782. Okay, so um, we know that there was two... Um, branches of government. You know, there was many more in the Continental Congress working with the European Masons slash Rosicrucians, who originally taught by Moors, taught Moorish science, to form a Novus Ordo Seclarum, which was known as the New Secular Order of the Ages, or what is called the New World Order. All right, or um, you know, the, Mar um, the um, Moroccan Treaty. Um, is very powerful because, according to the Constitution, Constitution, the treaties are the law of the land. So there was two governments in North America. One was the Moorish federal government, and the other was the European state government. Um, this was fact. Um, this fact can be observed on the back of any dollar bill, you know, or what's called a federal note or um, IOU fiat note. There was two national seals on the back of the one dollar bill. All right, the pyramid on one side and the eagle on the other side. All right, the pyramid is our seal. The pyramid represents the Moorish federal government, and the eagle represents the European colonies. There was 13 states based on the 13 um, um, Delaney um, Lanape tribes called Fire Nations. The European colonists who adopted in the first of the 13 tribes, uh, which was the eagle tribes. These 13 tribes were patterned after the 13 clan mothers of the matriarchal government. The Iroquois finally succeeded in overthrowing our government by tricking us into accepting the role and position of the woman. Later, four of the six nations of the Iroquois themselves were conquered by an insidious plan um, into the action um, by the col um, colonialists and the Britons, which was prior to the Revolutionary War. You know, the Moors stood in the center holding the great chain of friendship with the European at one end and the Indian nations at the other. They controlled the Delaware River, uh, which was called the Lanape River originally. The more side of the government trusted in na trusted in nature's law and nature's um, God, all right, uh, for their guidance. This is who we trusted in. The two nations can be seen in the preamble of the Constitution. Hence, we the people, we the people of the United States, is actually talking about the Lenape, which is the Washita. Right, and it says, "Well, we the people in the United States, in order to perfect or form, excuse me, a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity." Um, prosperity. Um, do obtain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. 
You know, so as we can see, the preamble of the United States of America spoke of two governments, the United States and the United States of America, to form a more perfect union. All right, we are from the United States, um, as we say, of America in a sense. Um, all right, oh, excuse me, we, we are the United States. Now, the United States of America, um, you know, that that would be of. You know, we know that the United States of um, America, you know, America is not of the United States. All right, so um, that is also something that we have to look at, too, because we just went over the definition of the word America. And we've seen what the term America means. America means copper, skin tone, natives. Now, that makes sense because according to six presidents by Sister Arsette and also five black presidents or five Negro presidents by um, by Jay Rogers, they both state that Abraham Lincoln was of Moorish descent. So hence the reason why he's put on the penny, which is copper. All right. So what we're doing is just trying to tie all this bit of information together here. All right. Um, as we were saying, more dirty little secrets, which is volume two by Dr. Claude Anderson. He says the power of. Um, I mean, he says the first president was black. It is not well known that the first president of the United States was John Hanson, a black. It says John Hanson, a black man, a two dollar bill sitting in the fifth seat on the left, was the first black of the United States. Even in America, best selling pocket constitution, which it says the United States Constitution and its fascinating facts about it states that John Hanson was the first president of the United States. Um, my eighth grade teacher um, told us this. Um, his name was Mr. Harrison, and he said that um, there was um, presidents prior to um, George Washington, and he mentioned John Hanson as being the first president up under the Articles of Confederation. All right. So uh, we know that there was many more um, wars um, during that time period in which that came into um, that particular seat. You know, matter of fact, there was um, eight of them prior to George Washington um, getting that position. All right. Um, we had um, um, Elias Bontano, Thomas um, Mifflin, Richard Henry Lee, John Hancock, Nathaniel Gorham, Arthur St. Clair, and Cyrus Griffin. Those was the eight presidents up under the Articles Confederation um, prior to Washington. All right, um, John Hanson served from November the 5th, 1782, to November 1783. Elias Bolton served from November the 4th, 1783, to November 1784. Um, Thomas McFlynn served from November the 3rd, 1784, to November um, 1785. Um, Richard Henry served from November the 30th, 1785, to November the 1786. John Hancock served from November the 23rd, 1786, to June 1787. Um, um, Nathaniel Goham served from June 6, 1786. Um, excuse me, 87 to February 1787. Um, 88, excuse me, and um, Arthur St. Clair served from February 20. Um, February the second, seventeen eighty-eight to January seventeen eighty-nine, and Cyrus Griffin served from January twenty-second, seventeen eighty-eight, um, to um, the end of um, eighty-nine. In other words, he served right up until um, George Washington came in, as we would say. So, um, interestingly, there was no states before the first state, which was Delaware, which. Um, it wasn't until the term of um, Arthur St. Clair, who served from February the 2nd, 1787, to January 1788, as the seventh president under Article of Confederation, there was no states. The first state was um, the state of Delaware. So what states were they referring to as the Union states? These are all questions that we have to ask. You know, I'm 
All right. Um, let's see here. The Constitution applies under the Article 6, specifically for us, if you read Article 1, Section 2, it declares us supposedly a three-fifths of a person, which is a subhuman. However, as if we let them categorize us as such, Article 6, however, states that the United States um, Constitution, its laws, and the treaties are the supreme law of the land. So hence, any treaty that was ratified prior to 1789 is actually still in standing. So in 1787, um, the treaty between um, Morocco and the United States was um, in place at that particular time, all right? Um, for all intended and purpose, it was not the kingdom of Morocco in Africa. It was here. This was the Morocco, or al Morocco, or Mexum. So we also have to understand that, too. All right? Um, the articles do not um the articles of association well you you have four constitutions you have the articles of association the articles of confe um, um confederation and you have the declaration of independence and you have the united states constitution and its bill of rights those are the four constitutions the articles of association was written before the constitution so in that sense it supersedes it but not as far in terms as law, because remember, they was perfecting it. All right? It was being perfected. So um, we see that um, during that perfection, um, the Articles of Association was written um, around the time of the First Continental Congress. And the First Continental Congress um, was under Peyton Randolph. All right, and he was the great great grandfather of Pastor Beverly Randolph. All right, who was the supreme grandmaster of all the Rosicrucians in the world. All right, then you have Henry um, Middleton, and you have Peyton Randolph again, and John Hancock. Then you have um, Henry Lauren. John Jay, Samuel Huntington, um, Thomas McKeon, and there was eight. So there was eight presidents under the Continental Congress. So this is before the Articles of, Con of um, Confederation presidents that we just finished mentioning. It was under the Articles of Association, the Continental Congress. All right. Um, Peyton Randall served um, as president over the um, Congress, Continental Congress, from September the 5th, 1774. Um, from May 10th, 1775, all right, um, Beverly Randolph, oh, excuse me, um, Henry Milliton served from October the 22nd, 1774. Um, excuse me, um, Peyton Randolph came back and served from um, May 10, 1775, and then John Hancock came and served from May 24, 1775. Henry Lauren came back and uh, came um, to be president of the Continental Congress November 1, 1777. John Jay, December 10, 1778. Samuel Huntington, September 28, 1779. And then Thomas McKean, July 10, 1781. And then it goes into... The articles of, of, of um, from the Articles of Association and the Declaration of Independence to the Articles of Confederation, which started with John Hanson. All right, so um, this is what they are talking about. Now, um, I got a question in the chat room. I'm speaking about um, um, Saint Tammany. Tammany was the chief of the Leninapi, um, popularly nicknamed a saint. Um, um, Timani 
um, signed a peace treaty with William Penn. It's the same. This is what we're talking about, the land grant, in Philadelphia in 1683. His model was unite in peace for happiness and war for defense. His name was appropriated by the New York City corrupt um, Tanami Hall, or Mount Tanami, at the Delaware Water Gap and St. Tanami um, Parish, Louisiana, which is the territory of Washington. The state of Philadelphia is named after William Penn, as we spoke about earlier. But it was um, him who was the chief that specifically signed um, uh, with William Penn. The name um, Tanami comes from the Native American um, word, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, it means um, of many lands or the land of the Moors. All right. Now, when you get into who he was, it says um, specifically that um, that Benjamin Banneker, who they refer to as Benjamin Franklin, was the grand governor of the Society of of um, 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 Temeny which was the secret society dedicated to the chief of the Moors that met with William Penn, who was the founder of the Quakers, which was a Rosicrucian group. All right, the Quakers are all Rosicrucians. This is something similar to what Christians believe in today, in which that was, um, in which that they refer to it as um, getting struck with the Holy Spirit, or fire shut up in my bones. Um, uh, when you go to the Holy Rollers or the Holiness Church, the Quakers, that's what that was all symbolic to, the activation of the Kundalini energy. All right, um, William Penn, he was referred to as um, um, Mikyon. All right, that was the name that they gave to him. He himself pointed out that the indigenous people have very dark skin. All right, they was adopted into the 13 tribes as we spoke about who was known as the Eagle Clan, or the Lani Wapi, all right, being of the first of the 13 tribes. This is how they got in, okay? And then we can see how um, the information was traded over because here, even in North Carolina, we have a group of Shriners who have on their car Sudan Temple, you can look them up online, Sudan Temple. Put that in your intro search, Sudan, S-U-D-A-N, Sudan Temple. And you will see that they acknowledge that the information comes from Africa. However, they the keepers or the gatekeepers of that information. In other words, that information is not going to be released until you come back into who you are. So we're dealing with those Crucians, Shriners, Masons, secret societies. And if you're not symbol literate, you won't know the codes. You won't know how to decode. And you continuously be a pawn in their game. All right. All right, let's see here, see if we got any more questions. Okay, it says that the Constitution not even being followed by um, those who's been put into position. How do you teach honor amongst thieves? You don't. They're already supposed to have been taught it. What I mean by that is that according to this information within the secret society, they're supposed to be taught honor, justice, 
virtue. These things, they are already supposed to have been taught. They haven't been able to apply it because it's just worries for them. They've never been taught the actual exercises in order to master it. They've never been taught how to raise the Kundalini through the various chakras in order to um, move beyond the lower self into the higher self. This is the reason why Prophet Nobud Ali brought us um, the information um, that's within our authority, the 101, the 102. The question is for Moorish Americans, for Moorish children, in which that also can be found of the um, higher self and lower self um, within the Allahu Lessons, I think it's Chapter 3 of the Holy Quran, Circle 7, in which that it teaches us uh, specifically about the science of the lower self and higher self, which is within ancient comedic teachings or ancient Tamarian teachings is Set in Heru. Set is the lower self. Heru is the higher self. So we can't teach those principles. Those principles had to be taught, um, you know, already. You know, they have to be um, taught already. What I mean by already, I'm talking about um, you had to be taught these things in the family. Uh, when you get outside into the world, you should be able to um, util um, utilize those particular things in which that you were taught in order to build. If not, then, of course, um, you haven't mastered it, you know. So all of these things must be done, you know. So we can't teach them. Now, we can hold them to their oath because they did take an oath. All right, and the oath is actually to um, hold on to the secrets. Okay. However, um, this is what we mean by becoming symbol literate. You have you need to learn the signs of masons because that's what they also recognize. I remember I went to court um, for a um, ticket violation. It was um, having no license, and my license was revoked or suspended, one of those two. And I went into court, and they called my name, and I said, I raised my hand um, from the heart into um, a 90-degree perpendicular level, my right hand up, and I took it and put it back to the heart, and I told, them, and I told the court that I'm a moor. The judge told the bailiff to leave me alone because he kept trying to tell me to take off my hat. And eventually she fussed at the bailiff and told him that she was going to send him out the courtroom if he don't leave me alone. The bailiff now, she was going to send the bailiff out. And she told the bailiff that I know more about this than you do, son, so I advise for you to leave it alone. Now, why did she say that? Because I threw her a sign. It wasn't a Masonic sign per se, but she seen it as a Masonic sign because those same signs are within the temples of the Moor Science Temple of America. When they see Noble Jolly, um doing his stance, those those feet at a 45 degree angle, that is a Master Mason stance. When they see his hand at the heart, that is a Royal Arch um, degree of the Second Veil. On the York side, or the York rights. So when I did it, that's what she seen. And so she fussed at him because she knew the degree in which I was working with in that regard. And she told the DA to um, drop the charges. And so I never even stood in front of the judge. The DA came to me and spoke to me over the bar. I never even went into the lines then, as they would say. And he went on ahead and just dropped the charges. Dismissed them. Matter of fact, on the report, it says disposed of. So these are the things in which that we have to learn. We have to become symbol literate and sign literate so that we can begin to um, defend ourselves. And this is the way in which that we make them uphold their oath. If you don't know how to make them uphold their oath, then yes, they will be fiends. 
because there's nothing in which that they are held accountable for. But that sword is over their neck as a shriner. All right? And according to um, Elijah Muhammad, in the justice lesson, um, 1 through 14, which is actually um, the 10, it states, why must Muhammad or any Muslim murder the devil? What is the duty of each Muslim in regard to the four devils? There's a sword, you know what I'm saying, on their neck. Why do we make them study 35 to 50 years so that we will not cut their heads off as quickly? <laughs> you see? So these are all Masonic lessons and codes that is coming from the Nation of Islam, that's coming from the Moral Science Temple of America, that's coming from the Nation of Gods and Earth. It's embedded inside of those documents, the 120 lessons. Now, even, even though they might say that it's not Masonic, then what is it when we're using the same signs and symbols? Let's say it's not Masonic. Well, let's say it's free Masonic, which is more science, in which they relegate it down to their particular perversions, which is called Rosicrucian, Shriner, and Masonry. But they're still using the same science. Okay. Now, um, someone put, um, understand the royal arch um, relates to the sign of Virgo, which is the husbandry, which also deals with gathering, harvesting, reaping what you sow. Um, in the um, in the royal arch, um, you have um, what is called um, the hand being put inside of the bosom, which correlates to what's in the um, Old Testament in the five books of um Moses, what is called the Pentateuch or um, the Torah, in which that Moses supposedly put his hand in his bosom. I think it was in the book of Exodus. Put his hand in his bosom, and God told him to put his hand out, and it was leprous, as, um, white as snow. And then he told him to put his hand back in his bosom, then it was of the other color. If you would notice that on most of the pictures, Napoleon and others, they have their hand inside of their bosom, symbolic to concealment. Noble Dr. Ali does not have his hand inside his bosom. It is outside, symbolic to revealing. So these are the two characteristics in which that we have to build with and deal with in regards to these uh, matters. And if you, once again, if you're not simple literate, then you're going to miss the whole point. All right? This is how we're going to get back our information, is by going into our information and getting it back from those who perverted it, not by running away and being scared of ourselves. You know, oh, Luciferian, oh, they worship Lucifer. Albert Pike in the Moral and Dogma say, oh, they worship Lucifer. Lucifer is nothing more than the angel Uriel, which is one of the seven archangels. And Uriel was once the second highest angel in heaven, and he fell um, to become um, the ruler over the depths of hell, of Hades. But that is nothing more than the Kundalini falling from the pineal gland, falling into the abode known as the sacral bone area, or what is known as um, above the crack of your behind, as we would say. That's what that is talking about. Not no scary outside, fictitious entity outside of yourself coming to get you. No boogeyman stories. No white Jesus come out of the sky for to save you either. He ain't coming on a cloud. Or that is somebody to Christ consciousness. Your mind manifesting that information through your brain, hence via the rest of the endocrine gland system, your hormones and your chemical body. You have 12 pair of cranial nerves that sits around the pineal gland. Those 12 pair of cranial nerves are symbolic to the 12 disciples. Jesus is symbolic to the pineal gland, which the soul is embedded inside of. The soul has an intimate connection with the breath of life. Inhale and exhale. It's through the inhale and exhalation in which that activates the soul principle that moves the energy kundalini from its sleep state, which is wrapped three and a half times coil at the base of the spine, up the spinal column, the 33 vertebrates, the 30 de 33 degrees of Freemasonry, Jacob's ladder, 33 years why Jesus was said to have died at 33. All of this is talking about your resurrection. Got nothing to do with no damn 
um, spooky fairy tale stuff in which that y'all been used to. Once again, if you can't break this information down, you know, me truthfully, you know what I'm saying, um, I feel like a lot of um, lecturers and people need to be quiet and sit on the sidelines until they do more research and study because they're not teaching the people how to apply this information and how it applies to the physical body. As above, so below, as within, so without. They got Negroes caught up into fairy tales about the Illuminati. Yeah, the Illuminati exists, but they're a very small group of people. Why don't you master yourself and become greater and wield everything that you want into existence? Everything comes through mind power. The mind is the magic wand. You are Merlin the magician. Or Merlin the magician. This is these are the things that we have to understand, overstand. Otherwise, um we keep, you know, trying to fight things outside of ourselves without correcting what is inside of us first. In which that will reflect outwardly. Once again, as above, so below, as within, so without. That's the law of correspondence. That's one of the seven principles of Tahuti or Jehuti, or Hermes Trimajestus, as he's also referred to as. All right? This is the um, information that we need to understand. So, we also know that when you go into these particular courts, um, U.S. District Court or whatever the case is, um, you have a public policy side and an invisible constitutional side, all right? Um, when you file a lawsuit or a counterclaim or a counter lawsuit, you don't file it under the miscellaneous section, all right? The case is filed under the miscellaneous section. It is also referred to as the green file by the clerk of courts. So anytime that they give you a ticket, you do a counterclaim or a countersuit, and you enter that countersuit into the constitutional side. But it's called the miscellaneous file and not the green file by the clerk of courts. Right. This is you're going to do it under natural law, common sense law, or common law, constitutional law. Because we are embedded in there based on treaties and based on the fact that we formed this government and we um, gave up our government. You know, we need to get it back. And the way in which they're going to get it back is by studying um, this particular information. All right. Let me see if there's any more questions right now. All right. Okay, somebody asks, how are we supposed to navigate on land, Brother Bay, or is it wrapped up simply in history? Um, the land issues, being that this is our land, um, there's certain things that we have to do. Like, for example, I wrote on um, our plates, on the United Washington plates, off and on for the last five years. Now, that means we wrote on our own plates, and we were stopped after about two years by cops, not by state troopers, not by sheriffs. For whatever reason, they seem to know a little bit more law. But the police, the municipality um, policy and forces, they stopped us. 
Now, they don't know um, any law. I mean, I mean, we got them on the stand, and um, we asked them when the last time that they um, read the Constitution, and they say like the eighth grade or high school, or, you know. So they don't know law. So we said, well, how can you enforce something that you don't know? Um, so we ran them out of the courtroom, and they never came back. So eventually those charges were dropped also. So, you know, it's up to you if you want to invoke your right to travel. You don't have to wait for anyone to do it for you. You don't have to wait for any laws to be passed because the laws have already been passed. If you read the United States Supreme Court um, cases, you would know that various laws concerning your right to travel have been passed since the Article of Confederation. In the Article of Confederation, it specifically speaks about the fact that you have the right to travel. All right? Um, if you read, um, go to the websites and pull up driver's license on versus um, right to travel versus driver's license. Pull that up. And you'll see the various laws in which that pertains to you having the right to travel throughout the various states and that federal law. You know, there's various um, laws in which that specifically speaks on it. You know, um, let me see if I can find some here. If you go to, like I said, driver's license versus the right. You can also find various um, YouTube clips. Many of them want to discourage you because um, you're taking things into your own hands. You can also go to RV Base um, Publications. Um, that's by um, Sister Rosmaria Bay and Brother Taj and Sister Anna E. They put that together. Um, excellent website. But even in Chicago Motor Coach versus um, Chicago, it says the use of the highway for the purpose of travel and transformation and trans transportation is not a mere privilege, but a common fundamental right of the, which the public and individuals cannot rightfully be deprived. Thomas versus Smith, the right of citizens to travel upon the public highway and to transport his property thereon, um, either by a carriage or by automobile, is not a mere privilege which a city may prohibit or permit at will. Well, they're making you get permits, call license, and they are prohibiting you from doing so, roadblocks, from being able to travel upon these particular areas. But yet, according to Thomas versus Smith, they're not supposed to. But a common law right, which he has under the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So even when you read in the Declaration of Independence, where it speaks about that you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um you know, which is actually um, common sense law or natural law, actually. You know, somebody shouldn't have to tell you that. That's actually supposed to be natural. Um, it says um, in Kent versus Dulles, the right to travel is part of the liberties of which the citizen cannot be deprived without due process of law under the Fifth Amendment. In um, um, Statutman versus Dulles, it says the right to travel is well established common right that does not owe its existence to the federal government. It is recognized by the courts as a natural right. See, they don't want you to be under natural law, natural person, natural right, because they want to own you. You're a commodity. You're a collateral. You're a slave. And they want you to be in that status because that's how they make money off of you. They don't want you thinking. Thinking is too hard. It's too much. This is why opium was given to the Chinese um, during, the, um, during the rule of um, 
of many of the um, dynasties was to make the Chinese people docile, stuck on, you know, um, um, doing, um, you know, they they on opium. Opium make you lazy. Make you just want to stay in the bed. Fuck it, let me let me smoke. So you're not gonna think. And so now, your opium is TV. Your opium is music. Not even good music. Not even good TV. <laughs> you know, your opium is work, eight hours. They gave you plenty of opium in this society. The foods you eat, genetically modified organisms or GMOs, toxic water that's very acidic. They have ways of shutting down your genetic components and capabilities to keep you from thinking. Fluoride is one of the main things. Remember, fluoride was used during World War II to keep you from thinking. <laughs> It was for, it was a forgetful agent. That's what it was used for. So now fluoride is in the water, fluoride is in your toothpaste, fluoride is everywhere to make you forget. To make you forget. So we have to understand. Um, this is the um, government in which that we're dealing with. And if you're not trying to um, get a greater understanding, um, then um, really you're wasting your time. All right? Um, we're getting ready to um, in and out um, this particular um, segment. And we're going to see you all again next Wednesday. We appreciate you all for coming on and listening to us. I'm um, hopefully going to have those technical difficulties again. Um, next week. All right. All right. Peace. We out. First World Order Radio. Finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right. All right. There's always gonna be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to teach the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. <laughs>